Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. So I maintain being a football fan. I really like Cam Newton because he makes uh, football fun. He plays it for the fun of the game. He likes to celebrate. But the problem is the NFL don't like that he have fun playing the game. I'm like, NFL, stop. Stop being like that. Let him dab. It's cool. They're like, nope, 15-yard penalty. I'm like, then I think about it. I'm like, at the end of the day, it is just a football game. It ain't that serious to be having to celebrate. You know who I want to see celebrate? I want to see people in real life who should be celebrating. I want to see a doctor come out of surgery. Like, hey man, how did the surgery go? I want to see a fireman come out of a burning building. Like, hey, did you say the baby? <laughs> all right, well, so great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, welcome to the conclusion of our series we have been working through. We are calling My Church. But before I do that, I always like to take a moment, look into the camera and say welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad wherever you are that you could get uh, behind a computer screen, your phone, a tablet, whatever. We're glad you're here, okay? Vineyard, would you put your hands together to welcome those who are joining us online? Awesome. We're glad you're here. Well, very good. Well, as I said, I, I just want to say I've been in love with this series. I might be biased because this is my church, but I love this church. I love it. And the past two weekends, we've been talking about values and principles that makes this church what it is. What makes Vineyard Church what it is? That's the values and principles of our church. So we've been looking at that. And the cool thing about this series is it's not just values and principles that make up this church, but it's values and principles that we can apply to our lives. And when you do, you can never come back, you, you can never come back to Vineyard. And if you apply these things to your life, it would change your life forever. I'm telling you, okay? Well, we're going to start right, off the, right at the top of your outline. We've been looking at the book of Daniel as kind of the theme. There's a theme verse we've been looking at for this series. It's been the backdrop, and that's, we're going to start right there so you can see on the top of your outline. It's uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. It says, now Daniel so distinguished himself. Why don't you underline distinguished himself? Distinguished himself. Church, distinguish yourself. Among the administrators and the satraps, <coughs> satraps are just uh, local governors, kind of local authorities, and by his how? Exceptional qualities. Why don't you underline exceptional qualities as well? Because how did he distinguish himself? By, he didn't have this amazing gift. No, it was his exceptional qualities. You develop qualities. Exceptional qualities that the king, that's the king of Babylon, that's where he was at at the time, planned to set him over what? The whole kingdom, the whole country. See, that's what happens. When you start focusing in on these principles and values, you gain influence. You gain influence. And God gives you this influence for a specific reason, for a purpose, which is what we're going to look at today. All right? Well, the past two weekends, we looked at our first value was enjoys life. We as a church enjoy life, and we as people enjoy, enjoy life as well. And then last weekend, we looked at how we empower other people as well. We're called to call greatness out of other people. And today, we're going to look at one of my favorite values, probably the favorite value that makes this church what it is, and that is my church, my church doesn't just exist for me. No, my church exists for others as well. It exists for others. So that's the value. That's the principle I want to look at today. And it's not just our church. It's a part of our personal lives as well, okay? Well, you've probably been wondering why I have buckets up here. These aren't baptism buckets, so don't worry. <laughs> these are just buckets. I'm going to use these. I, as I really thought about it, as I kind of did message prep for this series, or this message, I decided, hey, God, how do, how do I illustrate uh, how we are supposed to exist for others. And I felt he said, hey, you need to first describe who's here first. You need to first help people see who they are. What bucket, that's what we're going to look at, what bucket do I fall into? Because that affects how you reach others. That, if, that affects how you exist for others, if you're able to reach others effectively. Okay? So that'll make more sense as we go through here. But what I want you to take away is watch the buckets, see which bucket you might fall into. You probably fall into one of these buckets. And I might invite you to be a part 
of a particular bucket, okay? All right, so I've got rocks here. I'm going to pick. This is me. Here's me. I'm going to pick. I'm right here, so I don't know where I'm going yet, okay? Watch the rock. That's me. So, okay. Let's look at the first bucket. These buckets are also the blanks on your outline, okay? So your first blank on your outline, this is the first bucket, the first group of people that I believe are here at the church as well as not here is people far from God. People far from God. That's your first blank on your outline is people far from God. Now, as I said, some of these people are here and some of these people are not here yet. And when I think about people far from God, uh, people that come to mind to me are people who could care less about God who don't know God, who, uh, you know, are maybe upset at God or angry at God. You know, when I think about people like this, I think of a friend I had, a good friend of I had through high school and and to college too, and we we would talk often. We'd spend much time together, and and I I would bring up, you know, (laughs) Vineyard. I'd be like, hey, you should come to Vineyard sometime, and uh, and it'd bring up the conversation of God. And when we talk about it, he would express that he he was just he could he was kind of stuck on the thought of God, and and that was because he had a uh, infant brother. He was about a decade and a half older, so we were about 16, 17 at the time, and his infant brother was born with a heart condition, and he had to have a heart transplant, and that's a serious surgery for adults, let alone an infant. And the child almost died, but ended up uh, surviving. They got a heart for it, and, but he has to get another heart transplant in 30 years, and my friend just. He, he didn't understand. He's like, why does a God that love, loves me, why would he let that happen? He was disappointed in God. He's like, God disappointed me. I, don't, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And you know, some of you might feel that way. You, God, why did this happen? I'm disappointed. This doesn't make sense. You're supposed to be a loving God. Why did this happen? So that's what I think of with people far from. Another, uh, when I think of this, I think of people who maybe have a false uh, security in God. This was me for a little while in a season of my life. I, you know, I, I came to church. I, I knew who God was intellectually. I could pass any Bible quiz, let me tell you. I knew who God was. And I even served a little bit in my church attendance. Yeah, the pastor was happy with me. But hey, that, that was knowing God. See, that's knowing God. Matthew chapter 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Why don't you circle that word knew, knew. That word in the literal translation, it it means closeness, intimacy, relationship. It's not just an intellectual knowledge. It's a relational knowledge. It's a relationship. So all that to be said, the point is though that that's... Even though you might know God intellectually, yeah, I I know who he is, that doesn't mean you're close to God, okay? All right, well, that's the first bucket. As I said, some of these people might be here, and a lot of these people are not here, okay? Our second bucket, this is the second group of people. This is your second blank on your outline, is wounded people, wounded people. So I'm going to add some people to these buckets while you write that. Wounded people. Well, some of these people are also here and some of these people are also not here yet. But I want to say if you are here and this, you're like, you already know I'm in this bucket. Hey, I want to tell you that you matter. We value you. We really do. And as Pastor Andy, he talked about this the other week, that this is a place for you. It really is. This is a place for you to find rest, to find peace, to kind of repair, to find healing. This is a place for you for that. You know, somebody came up to me a couple months ago. I was like, do I have to jump right into serving? I've been in church my whole life. I know that's kind of what you you guys are looking for. I said, no, no, that's not what we're looking for. I think that's what God's designed you for. But God also wants you to find healing. He wants you to find restoration. And how does the Bible say that happens? Well, the Bible says that happens in relationships. Confess your sins to one another and you will be healed. All that means is do life with somebody. Do life with somebody. So we do that here through small groups. That's the biblical model. Ministry took place house to house. We do that through small groups. And as Daniel said, our small groups launch today. And we do them by semesters. But we we do that because we value relationships. It's a place to find healing, to find freedom, and to grow. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. Well, what if there's not a group for me, Pastor Samuel? Well, let's, let's take a quick poll, okay? How many of you are married? Let's see. How many of you are married? Quite a few. Well, guess what? We have a married group. Okay, okay. Let's see. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. 
How many of you like to eat? Oh, liars who didn't raise their hand. <laughs> well, we have a lunch group. Ooh, ah. <laughs> all right, all right. That, that was too easy. Let's, let's try another one. How many of you like to run? Well, very few. How many of you should run? <laughs> well, hey, we have a running group. I'm telling you, there's a group for you. There's a group for you. We have a men's group, a women's group. We have a knitting group. We have an online group. We have a prayer group. We even have a youth small group. I mean, there's a group for you. And if there's not, come talk to me because we're going to find one for you, okay? There is a group for you. And the cool thing about our Vineyard Network system, which all that is is our network of relationships in the small groups, is that we've made it so it's easy to get in and it's also easy to get out. It's easy to get out. Yeah, there you go. I was thinking about you. It's easy to get out because we do the semesters. When it's done, it's done. You don't have to, like, see this person until Jesus returns. It's done. There's a season for growing and there's a season I need some peace. But it's also easy to get in. It's also easy to get in. It's one step. It's connecting with the leader. It's what we did with the tailgate today. The party is for you to connect with the leader. They're not going to pressure you. Don't sign up, sign up. They're not going to say that. No, they just want to know your name. just want to talk to you. That's all they want to do. Maybe you don't want to talk to them. Well, there's a board out there. My wife, Olivia, helped me make that board with all the Christmas lights so you wouldn't miss it. There's tags on there. You can just take off, and you can call them or email them later. We do the online on our website. You can see all the groups in the directory and shoot them an email. It's just one step. It's just connecting with them. What if I don't like the group I'm in, or what if I connect with the wrong person? It's okay. It's one step. Just connect with a different leader. It's one step either way. Well, because it's one step, it really comes down to one question. And that's, are relationships of value to you or not? Are key relationships of value to you or not? And and this would be one of them, I would argue, is that the plugging in the body of Christ is a key relationship. It really is. So, why is that so important? Well, because we say time and time again here at Vineyard that true, authentic life change happens in the context of relationships. We'll say that. You'll hear that a lot. (laughs) You've probably already heard it. And that's why we are church of small groups, not a church with small groups. Our church is made up of small groups, not with small groups, okay? So get in a group. I'm telling you, this church will always feel, whether it's this church, a church of 5,000, a church of 100, it'll always feel too big because we feel that bigness isn't connected to size. No, the feeling of big is connected to whether or not you're connected. If somebody knows your name, if somebody knows your face, So no matter the size, you will always feel it's too big if you're not connected. So get in a group. I'm telling you. It's one step, and that's today. It's where you will find healing, find freedom, develop some meaningful relationships. All right. Well, now we have bucket number three. This is your third group of people, and that is missional people. Missional people. missional people. These are people that have discovered their God-given gifts and are making a difference in the lives of other with, others with it. Wow, Samuel, that sounds nice. How do I discover my gifts? Well, today, step two of growth track. We're talking about gifts today. That's the whole talk about it. But these are people who are mission-driven. These are people who are mission-driven. And see, these people, they have an understanding that their primary responsibility is people who do not know God personally. And see, this is important, listen to me, because uh, we, we tend to slip into this place where, and it's human nature, where we think church is maybe just for me. That can happen, where, wow, this doesn't meet my needs. It doesn't meet my needs. But this group is always reminded that, hey, I don't, this church isn't just for me, but the church actually primarily exists for others. It exists for others, people who are not here yet. And I'm telling you this, I'm making a point of it because if you do not grab onto this, if you do not hold onto this vision, buy into it, the way we do church will bug you. I'm just being honest. It will bug you, okay? Why, well, why do we exist for these people? Because that's the people Jesus existed for. When Jesus was here doing his earthly ministry, he was, who did he hang out with? Not the religious people. He didn't come for the righteous, but he came to call on the sinners. He hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, just all these sinners. The religious people hated it. Oh, he's a, they called him names like a glutton and a drunkard. And that's because he would hang out with the drunk people. 
He would go to the parties. He would go sit down and have dinner with those people. He would encroach in their life space because he cared about them. He would go reach those people who were far from him. And and that's, I believe, the church is supposed to be the closest thing to resembling Christ. It's because it's made up of Christians. We're supposed to resemble Christ. It's not the government. It's not social programs. It's the church. It's the local church that is the hope of the world. The local church. And so that's why I never want to be satisfied. I love all of you, but I never want to be satisfied with just the people who are already here. There's somebody that needs to be here that is not here. You know, the most important number that comes across my desk during the week, I get the numbers from the previous weekend, and it's not, you know, the offering number. It's not how many of you are even here. It's how many visitors we had. It's how many people decided to follow Jesus that past weekend. In August alone, we had 16 people give their lives to Jesus. That's some, yeah, it's huge. And I share that with you because it's not just a number. It's not just a number. When, at the end of service, we always say, hey, if you made that decision, check that Connect card. Why we do that is so, because I see those, so I can put a name next to that check mark. And I put a face with that name. So when I see 16 on that sheet, it's 16 people and people that I exist for, that we exist for. Those are the people we're called to reach. And I will never forget, if that number starts dwindling, uh, some things are going to change around here because those are the people we exist for. We exist for those people. I never want to be comfortable, as I said, with the people who already are here. There's always somebody that's not here yet. And you might be saying, well, what does that have to do with me, Samuel? Well, if you are saying, if you want to say, this is my church, I want you to buy into that mission with me. I want you to buy into that vision with me. You know, several Sundays out of the year, doesn't have to be every Sunday, but several Sundays out of the year, you should have somebody sitting next to you who is maybe far from God or unchurched, somebody who needs to be here. Join me on that mission. And it might be inconvenient. It probably will. But, and I don't like being inconvenienced. You know, my wife Olivia can tell you that. I do not like being inconvenienced, especially when we fly. You know, we actually took a trip a couple months ago and doing a wedding out uh, somewhere else. And we were flying and... Uh, I like, when Olivia can tell you, when I like to um, fly, I like to just sit down, pop in my earbuds, listen to an audiobook, close my eyes, and be at peace. Well, if you fly, you know if you get that middle seat, those chances of peace go way down. <laughs> <laughs> and when we were, got our tickets, and for some reason, the airline put us in two separate rows. They were, they were right in front of each other, um, but they were separate rows, and I had the middle seat. And I was like, ugh. And Olivia had an aisle seat. And so, you know, I kind of sweet. I said, hey, baby. <laughs> Well, being the loving wife she is, she gave me that aisle seat. Uh, it was a short flight, but she gave me that aisle seat. So I sat down, we got comfortable, and as we were getting ready to take off, I looked back and I, I heard somebody talking to her. And I looked back and this guy was talking to Olivia. And, he was, and she kind of had her earbuds out and he was going on and on. I was like, whew, dodged a bullet. <laughs> 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 but I, I was actually listening, I, I kind of listened to the conversation and he talked the whole flight. And he talked about how I kid you not. He talked about how women were flawed to their core, how his previous two wives, it was their fault that he had a divorce, and how he was writing a book on how to solve the women problem. (laughs) Bless Olivia's heart. (laughs) But hey, as I was listening, Olivia, she listened. I would, honestly, I might have put my, I probably would have just put my headphones in. She listened. I was kind of looking back and she was, she was listening. She engaged with him. She would ask him questions. She would engage with him the whole flight. And right before we landed, she actually looked at him and she was, you know, she said, hey, you know, we're actually doing a series at our church right now. It's a couple months ago. We're, we're, we're talking about messy relationships and kind of how to work through that. You might, you might want to check that out. I'd love for you to be a part of that. You know, we do it online. And, you know, the guy said, wow, that's, yeah, I would love to do that. That'd be cool. And, he, and she invited him. And, you know, I don't know if I honestly would have done that. I'm being honest. I don't know if I would have done that. But Olivia reminded me in that moment that a missional person is always on mission. It's not just on Sundays. Even though some, you know, people aren't calling me Pastor Samuel, they call me Passenger Samuel. <laughs> I am always on mission, though. Always on mission. I never put down that mission. I'm always striving for it. And if this is, if you want to say this is my church, I invite you on that. It's not just Sundays. Vineyard's not just on Sundays. Our, our church exists throughout the week. That's because it's you. 
You're going out throughout the week. You know, the Bible says in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come in so that my house will be full. Is this church big? Yeah. Is it a little too big? Is it too big for me? Yeah, it's been that way for a couple years now. But hey, I'm telling you, I, I would be just as comfortable preaching one service, going home, cutting on the Steelers game. But as long as there's a heaven and a hell, it's not big enough. It's not big enough. There's still, there's an empty seat that has a name on that seat. As long as there's a heaven and a hell, it's not big enough. Even though it might be uncomfortable to me, that's my mission. That's my mission. And as a my church, that's my mission. Okay? Well, the last bucket, the last group of people, and this one can be a dangerous bucket because all of us, me included, we can slip into this bucket from time to time. And we all get tempted by this bucket. And that's the me people. Me people. Me people. See, as I said, we're all tempted by this at points. We can all slip into that because it's the human kind of pull to think about yourself. And some of you know, I think about others all the time. <laughs> well, if you, when you ever look at a picture, who do you look for first? Exactly. You look for yourself. And hey, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. That's human nature. It's the human frailty. If nobody else looks out for me, I have to look out for me. I got to think about me. And it's not a bad thing. We all have needs. We all have been wounded at some point. We all need to be pastored. We all need relationships. But if you start putting that as me, I need those things. And that's more important than other people. It starts to skew the vision. You start to lose focus. You start to lose perspective. You start saying, I want relationships at this church, but I don't want to go to a small group. I want that need met on the weekend. But the weekend's not meant for that. The weekend's not set up to facilitate deep relationships. No, it's set up to reach people far from God. Pastor, go deeper. I'm tired of you talking about that shallow stuff. Go deeper. No. The person who's drowning, who's far from God, does not need me to go deeper. They don't need the Greek word for life raft. They need a life raft. This church keeps getting bigger. I don't get it. It's because Olivia keeps inviting people on planes. <laughs> but she gets it. We never lose focus. We exist for others. I, I, I want to kind of pitch a scenario for you to kind of pit the two against each other. What a me person looks like versus what an exist for others person looks like. Let's take the weekend service, for example. The me person will show up, and they'll show up right at 930, and they'll kind of run to their seat. And they'll go, why do they start right, right at 9.30? There's no time for fellowship. And then they get to their seat. Somebody's taking their seat. <laughs> the others-oriented person will come early because they know that new people and visitors always come early. Then they'll go to the auditorium and they'll grab their seat and they'll look for to sit next to somebody they haven't seen before or somebody that looks like they're kind of lost. They don't know where they are. The me person, when worship begins, they're clapping yeah, I've heard this song before. <laughs> or, hey, that's, that's not really my style of music, or that's definitely a young person song. How am I supposed to worship to that? The others-oriented person will go, I've heard this song before, but to a new person, it's brand new. The others person will say, hey, I want to have worship that engages a multicultural and a multi-generational congregation. I want the young person who's far from God just as much as the old person who's far from God to be able to be here. The me person, the video announcements will come on and the me person goes, oh, growth track again. Growth track, growth track. Why are they always talking about that? The me, the, the we people, the others oriented people will get that, hey, we're on a mission. We're on a mission to help people grow, to train people, to disciple people, to develop people so that they can empower others. They not only see the vineyard culture of leadership development, but they engage in it. They also invite people to grow track. Hey, have you heard about that? The service, the um, speaking, you know, oh, small groups again. I've already told them I don't have time for this. The others oriented person will go, yeah, I'm busy. And I know relationships are important, but even more than that, somebody needs me to be their friend. It's a different way of looking at it completely different. And we can all slip into this. We can slip into this. 
And even dream teamers, if you're a dream teamer, you can slip into this too. Gosh, why do I have to go upstairs for a huddle before I serve? I already serve, and I don't even eat duck donuts. Why do I got to go up there? Hey, well, the others-oriented dream teamer will see that the most important part of their serve is that huddle because they're praying for that person who's far from God, from that, for that visitor who's going to come and we're going to serve. They're praying in that moment. It's a different way of looking at it. Well, I want to challenge you right now to kind of look at your outline. You have your four groups of people, and I want you to just ask God for a moment. Or maybe you already know. Put a, put a mark that only you can see next to one of those groups of people, which one you think you fall in. The me people, mission pe- missional people, wounded people, and people far from God. Well, while you're working on that, I kind of want to go back to the buckets and talk about them. The me people... <coughs> If you are in this bucket or if you are kind of slipping in this bucket, it's so easy to get out of this bucket. So easy. All you have to do is grab hold of the biblical promise God gives us. And that is in Luke chapter 18, verse 29. I guarantee this. Anyone who gives up anything for the kingdom of God will certainly receive many times more in this life and will receive eternal life in the next world to come. And there's other verses that also talk about it. It's a biblical promise. And what that verse says is that, hey, if you care for others, I will care for you. That's God's promise to us. If you bless others, I will bless you more. I've got you. Just trust me. Missional people. How do I get in this bucket, Samuel? If that's the bucket, I, I want to be in that bucket. Well, you go to growth track. You get on the dream team. You make a difference with your life. More so than you ever could alone. Because God designed us to be in the body of Christ. What if you're already in this bucket? will always keep sharpening your vision for the mission. Who's somebody that's not in this bucket that you can invite into this bucket? If you're in the wounded people bucket, listen to me. I, we value you. You're not a project. You're not a broken person that for us a project to work on. No, you're part of the team. We value you. And this, this one I, I love the most. I help run small groups and I love this one my heart is here and that's because one of the cool things about the Bible is this we all go through this as I said but the Bible says you don't have to be stuck here you can be a wounded warrior you still have a purpose in your life even when you've been wounded you can still make a huge difference more to come there's more to come so get in a group start that process of developing those relationships even if it's a scratch, a nick. Get in a group because those relationships are what catapult this. And then people far from God. This is where it all begins. It's getting close to God because this fuels the rest of the spiritual journey. It's when you know God, you have a relationship with God. It's the lifeblood of Christ that flows through you and compounds your ministry in ways you can never imagine. That really is the DNA of our church. The My Church values we've covered, if those are kind of who we are, the blood, the lifeblood of that is Christ. Well, here's me. And I've, I've been in this bucket, and I've been in this bucket, and I probably will be in this bucket again. And shoot, I've slipped into this bucket times. But I choose to be in this bucket. Because I'm on mission. And that's what God's called me to do with my life. And I invite you to pick up the values we've talked about in this series and join me in this bucket. Would you bow your heads? Come Holy Spirit. Just ushering in God's presence. God, you're already here. I pray that you make it known that you're here. Yeah. Yes, Father. Stir inside of us. Speak to us individually. Father, for those people who put a mark, or even if they didn't put a mark, but they're like, God, am, am I in the me people? Is that, well, that's the Holy Spirit. If you have an impression that you might have slipped into the me people buck, bucket, it's the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, you're in this bucket. Or be careful. You're slipping. 
And really what it is, is he's saying, trust me, trust me. I've got you. I'll take care of your finances. I'll take care of your relationships. Trust me. Yeah, I'll take care of that marriage. You continue to serve others faithfully, and I promise to serve you. I will care for you. Missional people, I pray, Father, for these individuals that you are continually sharpen their vision for the mission. Lord, if they're in this bucket, I pray right now that you just pop a name in their head of somebody that's not in this bucket that needs to be in this bucket. Yes. Give them the courage to empower that person. And for wounded people, God, just press on their hearts that they are loved deeply by this church, but even more so by you. You care for them. And you want to heal that wound. You want them to experience freedom. Give them the courage to step into relationships, to initiate some meaningful relationships that all not only bring restoration, Father, but it'll bring healing, it'll bring freedom. It'll bring clean sight to what am I supposed to do now? It'll make that clear again. And for people who put the mark next to the first bucket, Father, this is where your heart is. This is where your heart is. It's for those people that are far from you. Father, we read in Luke 15 that uh, about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. You're all consumed. You have 99 sheep. You've got, you've got your kids, but you're consumed with that one kid who's far from you, that one person who's far from you. Even if it's one person, you'll leave 99 people to grab that one, to bring him back. This is where God's heart is. God loves you. If you put your name in bucket one, I want to tell you that God loves you. <laughs> and my favorite part about bucket one with people far from God is that's the easiest bucket to get out of. It's the easiest one of all of them. And that's because it's one simple step into the umbrella of grace and love coming before Christ. Saying, Jesus, I don't have it together. You know that but I surrender it all to you. I surrender my wounds. I surrender the good and the bad, Father. It's all it is. It's one step. If you're like, God, am I in that bucket? Listen to him. Listen to him. If you feel that impression on your heart, the Bible says that God will knock at the door standing. That's what that is. It's the Holy Spirit speaking. Come home. Trust me again. Maybe. Trust me. Maybe you've stepped away. You've taken the controls back over for your life. You've kind of maybe pushed God to the side. Yeah, I've got this for a little while. Boy, give the controls back. I love to describe my relationship with Jesus as one word, and that's surrender. You just surrender it all to him. You come into his love, his open arms. It's one step. And all that is is a prayer. And I want to pray with you right there in your seat. I'm not going to make you stand up or run down front. I want to pray with you right there in your seat. If you're going, Samuel, that is me. Count me in. I, I, I need to get my life right again. I, I need to hand the controls over to God. I need to trust him. I've never known God like you talked about. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? I see that. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah, I saw that. Praise Jesus. Courage to take that step, Father. Yes, Father. More of your presence. Well, if you raised your hand, I want you to pray with me. And if you're online, I want you to pray with me too. If, would you just say, I'll help you with the words. You just got to mean it. You got to believe it. Say, Father, 
I receive your forgiveness. I love you. Teach me to know you as much as I know how. I love you. It's as simple as that. I promise today to surrender my life to you. Whatever that means. I might not even know what that means. But I surrender to you. I promise to serve you and to love you as much as I know how. In Jesus' name. Father, I just pray for those people who prayed that prayer. That today would be a day where their roots, roots just dive deep into you. That each day their relationship would just grow more and more and they would experience new depths of your love. Father, I pray for our entire church, whatever bucket or whatever group of people they may be. And Father, that you would show them what those next steps are and you would give them the courage to take it. Father, all the glory and the praise goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.